different ways uh, that we did this. So the first is completely random partition, um, as because we wanted to compare with something else, right? Compare with kind of the status quo. And the second is geographic structuring, just like I showed you. And this is an example of one bin where we made the model with, or one, yeah, one iteration where we made the model with these records and then um, tested with those. However, here we took the background from the whole region. Then we did what uh, we call a masked geographically structured approach, where the occurrence data are partitioned exactly the same, but we only took background information that correspond to the regions of the bins used in making the model. Okay? So, think about this contrast a little bit, and think about what predictions you might have, or what might make sense, or what might be problematic about one, and what might be an issue with the other. Any thoughts? So, the last one is like a transfer. In some way, is it? It's what I would consider a strict definition of a transfer. Yes. So there's a possibility of uh, needing to extrapolate an environmental space here if we have non-analog conditions. If you have truncated responses over here and non-analog conditions over there, that's certain. So that's something to be watching out for here. What about this guy? I'll tell you, there's, there's a problem, or at least a potential problem, with this approach. Taking occurrence records from part of our study region, but comparison data from the whole region. Maybe it has to do with omission rates. And, and I think if you are assuming that part of the region where you do, do not have presences, are used as absences? Mm. Yes, they're used as background. Yeah. I think there is a kind of imbalanced, imbalanced analysis of what are omission errors and commission errors. Yeah. So we are, we're, we're telling the model, we want to, to compare the, the environmental conditions of these presences with what's available across this whole region, right? But we're not going to give you the presences over here. Right? So what this mimics is, this, it makes this, a perfect dispersal barrier, right here. Okay, so we're taking background data from on the other side of the dispersal barrier, okay, which violates one of our assumptions, right? Our dispersal demographic noise assumption, right? So this this should be a problem. We should be tricking the model or telling the model to do something that that's not right. Okay. Um, so those are the three ways that he built the model. So let's look at evaluations. So, well, yes, back. certainly. I, I don't know if I see the difference between the two, the last two. The last two? Okay. The occurrence data for each iteration are the same. Mm -hmm. Okay. They are the black dots to make the model and the white dots to test it. Mm -hmm. Okay. The gray areas here, I think this is, I don't know, some temperature variable that he showed. This is where we take our background information. So this one, it only corresponds to the geographic areas of the bins used to make the model. Here, even though the, um, the occurrence, the positive points, come from only these areas, we're taking background data from this whole region. So the difference is whether or not we're including background information from this geographic region where we are artificially exclude occurrence records to save them for testing. Very practical, but what is the scale of these maps? What is the scale? I'm sorry, yes. So I have this new student who is who came from a geography master's program, and every time anybody in the um, in the lab makes a map without a scale, we get in big, big trouble. Is that, no, it helps me to do it in practice. Um, the, the, the size of how okay. many... Yeah, so like... Yeah, so... Uh, my archivals over, over here. So this is Panama, and this is the Colombia-Venezuela border, and this is Trinidad. It's a big, big area. It's a big area. Okay I mean, from here to there it takes five hours in a car. Yeah. <laughs> so you exclude it. You exclude, that's in the middle, but you, you include a big background. 
Yeah. So lots of cells. Yes. Yeah, so it's not the number of cells. There's, there's lots of cells. The difference between the two is going to increase if there is a gradient from the west to the east, right? Um, right, right. If there were no environmental differences at all, it should it should be no problem. Yeah. Right. Right. Okay. Okay. So then we look at performance. Now let me show you what these uh, curves are before we try to interpret them. The dash one is the performance on the. So this is the average of all the evaluation bins. Okay, this for all this. But this one is uh, for the random subsets, the random splits. This one here is the geographic structure, but taking the background for the whole region. And this is the geographically structured um, evaluations, but taking background only from the regions that correspond to the training data. Okay. Then we did two little experiments, just a default randomization up here at the top where we did um, random splits with unfiltered data and with a random sample of unfiltered data, right? Because we wanted to see, well, basically, we suspected that filtering our data spatially, um, as Chris was talking about, would help reduce the effects of, reduce the effects of sampling bias, right? So let's just think about this. If we have by a sampling, and we randomly divide things into training and test points, what should that do to our measures of performance? Make them higher or make them lower? Compared to what they should be. By a samples and training and test points random, and so you have test points close to training points, should your evaluation statistics be realistic or not? What? I thought I'm staring at this. You say the lower the lower uh, graph is the one that you take all your part and have the biggest background. Okay, we will do. Yes. We, we will, well, let's do this step by step. It never happened to me. And all the models are there. We'll, we'll, we'll go through this graph step by step. But the first part is going to be understanding the filter and the filter. Because all of these are based on our big experiments where we filter our data set to try to reduce the effects of sampling bias. So let's think about this and see what our prediction is. If we have all of our records, no spatial filtering at all, except we can't have more than one in per pixel, and we have strong sampling bias, we divide things randomly, and so we have training and test points in these clusters close to each other, right? Is that a realistic, valid test? No. no. Okay. Because it yes, comes to why. And it should tend to do what? That artifact should do what to our um, value of evaluation? It will be higher. It's going to artificially increase, inflate our estimate of performance. Right? And we predict that our filtering will reduce that, um, that problem. Right? So the very first comparison is simply to compare what happens with the unfiltered records to what happens with the filtered records. So this is random splits, unfiltered data, random splits, filtered data. So we need this is lower than that, right? So we, can, we have this little experiment says that as we expect, we have a higher estimate of performance when we don't filter our occurrence records. Does that part make sense? Yeah? So this, um, this tells us that yes, uh, the filtering seems to have helped, right? And that if we, we don't know if we have the exact right distance to filter out sampling bias. We filtered by 10 kilometers. We've got the largest set uh, of occurrence records possible that satisfy the constraint of every pair of localities being at least 10 kilometers apart. Okay, so that first thing says we shouldn't trust evaluations with random splits um, and certainly not with um, unfiltered data. Okay, not all these uh, faces are happy, but any questions before we move on or we're going to try moving on? Well, just yes. a question. What 
what you mean by filtered is like when you didn't there's a two parts Correct. Yes. Yes. And I mean this thinning thinning, thinning is what you call it. Yes. Okay. So then if we forget those guys and we look at these curves, we have this one dashed for a particular reason. The randomly partitioned one, we we have a dash because based on our principles, um, if we're doing these random splits, should we trust those or are we worried that those may inflate um, our estimates of performance? We're worried about that. Okay. And so then, when we go down here, and we have our geographic splits, and we're taking the background from the whole region, we have drastically lower measures of performance, right? We have this one little peak over here, and we have drastically lower than the others. But when we, um, and we know this violates our assumptions, right? Of excluding occurrence records from one region, but going ahead and taking the background from that area. When we mass out that area for background sampling, then our curve goes up to this, which is almost as good as our estimates of performance with the random subsets. Right? So this is with AUC, which is, um, um, which is this measure of overall performance. What we want to, what we conclude from this graph is number one, um, the filtering uh, reduced our estimates of performance, so we, uh, we don't want to test trust random splits, right? Um, especially with unfiltered data. Number two, um, we don't trust this curve, and we do trust that one, um, but yet this one seems to be getting as good uh, performance as the other one. And definitely, we're getting better performance uh, when we here, when we only take the background from the region that corresponds to the, the points used to make the model. Okay. So then we're looking at AUC for something different. Has anybody seen AUC diff that Warren proposed? I don't know what it is. Diff. So it's the difference between training AUC the minus with size work in the paper? Yes. 2011? I think so. Yeah. So the difference between, and that's a paper about model complexity, right? The difference yeah. between training AUC minus test AUC. Okay? So think about our graph over there. Training performance minus test performance. If our training performance is better than our test performance, uh, if it's a lot better, what does that tell you? Yeah, that's an indie, it's a, a very, very good definition of exactly what we mean by overfitting. We had a question. Is the number of presences equal? Uh huh. In in these, I mean, these three? Yes. Okay. Yes. Because we have the same number of records. This one is split in a different way from those two, and these two are exactly the same. And up here, when we did the filtering experiment, we did it for all records compared to the filtered records. And then this one right down there is a rarefied random sample of unfiltered records that has the same sample size as this. Okay. You mess the near yet, but the species is actually present quite well. And that's the reason why the AUC so went so low when you use the, the background. But you are telling him to consider absences. Yes. Yeah. But did you, you, then if you test it, if you can test also, for example, removing an area, uh, removing the area where you know it, you think it's an absent, and see what happens when you see the situation as well. Maybe. Right, right. You you can do that. Yes. Yes. yes sure. Yeah. And you know, it would be good to do these kind of things with simulated species where you don't worry about about interactions being heterogeneous, and you you know the perhaps. You don't include any dispersal limitations, so you know that's not a problem. What would you expect if I would do that with this? For example, if I would remove this desert area that has less, I mean, there's the more that has less area, right? That has less presences, how would what would happen to my AUC? Yeah. Um, I don't know about the AUC itself, but I don't think it would change. I don't think it would make your model better. more poor or better. The problem is when you 
when you include suitable areas that are unoccupied, that's when you can mess up the model. Including unsuitable areas that are unoccupied is not a problem. Yeah. So this next one is one of the ways to look at overfitting. So this is the difference between calibration NDC minus evaluation NDC. So first, and so big values are high overfitting. So this one are random splits. It's like this, but we don't trust it, right? Um, and then we have these two differences between the solid lines. This is when we took the background from the whole area. We, at, at low regularization, low protection uh, against uh, complexity, we have really high differences, huge differences. But even here, we have a difference of like 0.2 in AUC. Um, but that drops down really a lot when you, um, when you only take the background from the regions where the presence records are from. Okay? The other thing is look at this along the regularization multiplier. Because AUC itself did very much, but this difference varies a lot. Where are our complex models going to be? Left or right? Complex. Complex. Um, okay. Right. Overfit. Left. Yeah. Well, Complex models are more likely to be overfit, but just based on theory, with low regularization or high regularization, where should the complex models be? No. Yes, they're going to be over here. And these are going to be simple models. Okay? So what do we see with overfitting as we change, as we increase regular, regularization? Yeah, okay? And does that make sense or not? It does. Yeah. So we should have simpler models here that are less likely to be overfit. Okay? Now let's look at overfitting by looking at omission rate. How does this compare to the last graph? Yeah, it's quite similar. Um, and one thing, this particular threshold is you've heard of minimum training presence or lowest low <coughs> presence threshold. This one is a slightly higher one, 10 percent uh, percentile presence threshold. So we're setting the threshold at the value um, that excludes the lowest 10 percent of the training localities, right? And with that, we theoretically expect 10 percent omission of test localities if it's a, an unbiased sample. Okay, and what is about the lowest level of omission we get here? 0.1. Mm -hmm. Which in percent is? 1. Oh, 10. Okay, so we really, I, I kind of thought with Alex, I wanted him to put some dashed line here to show our expectation, and I don't remember why, but he didn't do it. <laughs> um, <laughs> students usually win at the end of the day. Um, but once we get down here, we get down to the emission rate that we expect, right? If you had used a minimum training presence, you would expect it to go down to zero, or very close to zero, eventually. Um, so again, complex models have really high emission rates, right? Ridiculous, even at one, we're getting emission rates of 25% to, you know, up to 50% with that other technique. Whereas once we go down to Regularization three or four, or four, you know, we're right where we expect to be. Okay? So anything above point one, we would interpret as overfitting in this particular example. Okay. Now we take a, okay, any questions right here? So we take a little step back, and regularization actually is applied to different feature classes with different coefficients that have been tuned empirically, right? Um, so the linear features have one value, and the uh, quadratic features have another, the hinge have another, right? What does, and those are in Max Center called the uh, individual betas, beta j, where j is a feature class. So what does the regularization multiplier do? Or who has ever varied this parameter? Okay, what were you doing when you did that? What did that do? The model more smooth than yeah. 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 That's good. That, that makes sense. That's the effect. Yeah. Right? Yeah. But what so the default is what? One. one. So this is a coefficient, so the default is one. If you don't change anything, it's one. It's right? If you put a two in there, what does that do? It's smoother. 
Okay, so that's, that's, that's your effect, right? Yeah, well, it, But it doubles it the protection, yeah. yes. right? If it's three, it's triple the protection, all right? So our default here is one. So what do you guys think of our performance here at default compared to some of these higher values? Well, it's quite low. Protection. Which one? One. For example, I mean, you get, you get, you have probabilities to have overfitting, strong overfitting. So we have, we're getting the signal of overfitting when we're using these low regularization multipliers uh, around default, or and even more as you go below default, and only at you know two to four in this case are we getting models that are not showing strong overfitting. Right? In this hard test, the hard test of predicting to another region. But um, that's the same kind of test that we want in order to demonstrate that yes, we have confidence across space so that we can tell readers and reviewers that we have confidence across time. Right? Okay.